welcome to lecture 6b emerging trends in network on chips we already learned about what is network on chip and what are the various design issues associated with network on chip right from topology to routing flow control and router micro architecture over the years network on chip has also grown in various dimensions both in terms of architectural optimization and also in terms of design space exploration in terms of topology so in this video we are going to learn about some emerging trends in the field of network on chip so that we will learn about what are the new categories of topologies that are emerging and what are the advantages of these topologies and what are the design aspect associated with these topologies we will also see about different types of topologies in network on chip the wireless nocs the optical nocs as well both as its own pros and cons over the lecture video we learn about them in depth look at this uh, scenario so far we were discussing about the 8 by 8 two dimensional mesh system now in this case if we really wanted to travel from one end of the chip to another you are going to take roughly 14 hops that is going to be the diameter of the system now consider larger systems like this this is organized as 32 by 32 two dimensional mesh system so it's going to give us 1024 cores it's really huge our future systems are going to be of this order we have 1024 cores on a single chip so if such kind of magnitude is there our traditional routing algorithms our mesh structure will it support we have to find out in this case if you wanted to travel from one end of the chip to another it's taking so many number of hops and you know that the, your router will consume one or two cycles and link is going to take another one cycle so it's going to be a quite a large uh, count to on reaching here so let us try to find out to reduce the diameter of the network how can i travel from one end of the chip to another when it's a huge multi core system uh, some techniques we will discuss today the first one is uh, multi drop links then we have three dimensional noc we have rf interconnects we have nano photonic and then we have wireless noc our attention will be more on wireless noc which is going to be the future trend but a, a couple of minutes i will spend on discussing on multi drop links 3d noc rf and uh, nano photonic noc so what is the idea of multi drop links can we design links where signals reach multiple routers in the same clock cycle something like this here we have the first router we have the second router we have the third and fourth router and we have specially designed links which are known as multi drop links so a signal that is starting from one router either it can get down at 2 or 3 or at 4 so that is going to be called multi drop links it's something like an express highway channel so it reduces the diameter of the network without the need of very high radix routers and these links are built up and broken down by sending bypass signal towards the destination a couple of research work is already done in this and today in this lecture i am going to give the links for certain uh, research papers also so that interested students um can work on this can go through it for finding out some good interesting topics the second type of uh, network that we are going to discuss is about 3d noc so far we have seen about two dimensional mesh or torus noc can we stack multiple such layers one over other and provide vertical interconnects and that is known as uh, three dimensional noc so we have uh, vertical the interconnects that is there so we have tiles now these multiple tiles are stacked one over other and then we have links which are there on the chip and we have vertical links also what are the benefits we can have higher packaging density and better noise immunity and we get superior performance as well uh, so this uh, paper will give you more detailed discussion on 3d nocs the next type uh, is the, in the 3d noc we have the vertical interconnects and we can have interconnects which are not by physical connections so we can use near field coupling schemes which eliminate the need for physical connection between layers so we don't have really a physical connection we can have two different mechanism one is called inductive coupling and other one is called capacitive coupling 
So, for longer transmission ranges, we can use the inductive coupling and uh, overheads of such kind of scheme can be eliminated by capacitive coupling. So, both by inductive and capacitive coupling, it is possible for us to communicate to upper layers without having through silicon wire. So, one approach is have vertical links, physical connection. Second approach is have inductive coupling. So, whenever there is a charge that comes in one layer, you come to know what is going to be the data that is to be recorded. So, by closer vicinity of uh, inductive and capacitive coupling also, we can transfer data from one layer to another in a 3D NOC. The next technique is going to be RF interconnects. So, it is alternative mechanism to traditional voltage and current signaling. So, normal signaling is our voltage and current signaling through metallic wires and the replacement technique is going to be can you transmit electromagnetic waves over micro strip transmission lines within this metal layer. So, we have your metallic layer and on top of the metallic layer rather than going for voltage current signaling, can we send electromagnetic waves over this micro strip and that technique is called RF interconnection mechanism. So, what we do? Signals are modulated using carrier waves at frequencies of the order gigahertz and then you send it through guided transmission lines. And signals propagate at the speed of light instead of charging and discharging of RC wires and we need to take it back to the baseband frequency and demodulate at the receiving. So, you have a modulation process at the sending side and then we have a demodulation process at the receiving side. So, signals are going to be modulated with carrier waves of the order of gigahertz and that is going to help you to transmit data at the speed of light than that of the, the charging of the RC wires. So, we get a bit of more explanations in this paper which is recently published. The next technique is all about fiber optic NOC or it is also known as nanophotonics. We use micro ring resonators which will divert light to a certain wavelength when a voltage is applied. So, only the other light passes through. So, we have a laser source and then we have a modulation through the optical wave guide we are going to send the signal. We have to detect whether light is present or not and then we are going to convert into electrical. So, you have an electrical component as well as an optical component in your NOC and this is an emerging field. A uh, lot of research work is happening in this field about nanophotonics. We can understand that when you or have a light that is going to pass through, when you apply some voltage on this micro ring, your light is going to bend across. That is one way or if it is an off position, then there is no bending. So, bending can be realized by applying proper potential on uh, the light signals that are passing through the waveguide. And so, we have seen the most important one of them are the 3D NOC with vertical interconnects we have photonic NOC and the next one is called the wireless NOC which we will spend little bit more time today. So, if you look at uh, this uh, structure, we can see that in each of this region, each region is marked with uh, blue coloring, each of the region we have identified certain nodes which have a wireless transmission capacity, wireless transmission and reception. So, you have normal communication that happens on top of this normal communication we have this wireless access points. So, long distance communication can be realized over this wireless links. Now, we have different types of wireless architectures. So, first one is called the ultra wide band wireless communication where radio frequency is used. We have wave guide wireless communication where the wave guide is passing through channels and then we have the millimeter wave. So, that is what we are going to focus, millimeter wave wireless connection. So, in millimeter wave, the wavelength is going to be in the order of millimeters which can reach only up to very small distance restricted to a chip. So, long distance communication, you can send the data or packet into these wireless hubs and these wireless hubs are going to send millimeter waves to adjacent wireless hubs, thereby your signal reaches uh, the required destination. So, consider a 16 by 16 concentrated mesh, it is called as C mesh. 
Now, what do you mean by concentrated mesh? You have a 16 by 16 organization, 16 rows and 16 columns. That will give you 256 points. Now, each of these node is having a concentration of 4. That means each of them is connected to another 4 nodes like this. So, this is the node what we have seen. And we have 4 of the processing units connected to this router. So, we have a 256 routers are there. But total of 1024 cores. That is called a concentrated mesh connection. Let us now try to understand a W cube structure. This concentrated mesh is represented as a W cube structure. So, look at this bottom corner where 16 nodes are being chosen. So, these 16 nodes form a W cube 0 and each of these 16 nodes, if you take that, we can have the numbering ranging from 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1. So, what you see here is known as a W cube 0. Now, each W cube 0 has 16 nodes as shown like this, 0, 0 up to 1, 1. Whereas, the red nodes indicates these are connected to computing nodes and the black nodes, these four are the black nodes and these black nodes are actually your L2 cache nodes and this is the wireless transmitter. So, each of the W cube 0 has a wireless transmitted which is located at the center of the W cube 0. Out of the 16 nodes that are part of the W cube 0, for 12 of them will be computing nodes and 4 of them will be cache nodes. And each of the computing node we can see that it is connected to 4 of the processors. So, this is what is known as a concentration of 4. Each of these processing cores, this is basically routers, each of these processing routers are in turn connected to four computing nodes. So, we have four of the cache locations and four of the computing locations. These four computing locations are directly connected to each of them and we have 12 such units. So, we can see that like that the entire 16 by 16 mesh can be divided into 16 W cubes. So, this is the structure of a W cube. Now, each of the W cube can be now represented as W cube 00, W cube 01, 1, 0 like that. So, that is the numbering scheme given to this W cube. And what you see here in each of the W cube is the transmitter. So, each of the W cube has its own transmitters and receivers. Now, let us see which all W cube can communicate to others. In the bottom right corner, we have a W cube 1111 and this W cube can communicate to four of its neighbors. The peculiarity of four of its neighbors are, these are the neighbors which are at a hamming distance of 1. So, 1111 can communicate with 0111. It can also communicate with 1011. It can also communicate 1110 and 1101. So, we have four of the W cubes to which the node 1111 can communicate. So, how are you going to obtain this? What is the peculiarity of this? 0111, that is this, is at a hamming distance of 1 with 1111. The numbering shows that these both W cubes differ only at the most significant bit. So, the most significant bit is the one that is varying. So, this most significant bit is varying, all the remaining 3 bits in the W cube numbering remain same. That means, they are at a hamming distance 1. Similarly, these W cubes also are at hamming distance 1. They differ only in 1 bit position. So, a W cube can transmit to all other W cubes which are at a hamming distance 1 in its numbering. That means, this is going to be the logical connection, it is a hypercube structure. These are all which are connected to the other nodes. Now, let us try to find out the addressing scheme. We have mentioned that there are 1024 uh, cores that are going to be connected with the help of this structure in a concentrated mesh. So, how will you tell the numbering? If it is 1024 nodes that are available, which are connected by an 256 grid structure, 16 by 16 grid structure, this 1024 nodes have to be represented using 10 bits. These 10 bits, the address of a node is presented like this. The first portion will tell you the W cube number. 
second portion will tell you the node within the w cube and the last portion will tell you out of that which is going to be the node under discussion so this means 1001 so this is the w cube that has been chosen with this number now within that w cube there is a zoomed version of 1001 we are going to 1110 so 1110 is been shown and within 1110 we have to go to 01 so this is the way how the addressing mechanism works the first four bits will tell you which is the w cube next four bits will tell you which is the node within the w cube that is being chosen by the bus four bits and the last two bits will tell you you have reached already the router now what is the core number that is connected to the router and since the concentration is four meaning four cores are connected to a single router going further let us find out let's say if a packet wanted to travel from 1000 0010 to 0010 to 0110 so the meaning is this is the source of the packet it's traveling from that w cube to a w cube this so this is the communication that we have to take in a normal wired communication by applying xy routing you can reach there now let us see how a deadlock free routing is possible so we will try to understand how a deadlock free routing happens first it goes to a Hamming distance 1. So, 100 is differing from 0000 only by 1 bit position. So, that can be directly communicated. So, you may be having a query, why can't the source and destination directly communicate? The reason is, the source and destination is not having a Hamming distance of 1. They differ in more number of bits. So, it is not possible. So, what we do is, we are trying to jump into an intermediate wireless hub which is at Hamming distance. So, this is the one that is being used. And then from 0000, we are moving into 0010. So, in two hopes, I reach the W cube of my destination. Now, from 1000, I have reached the, that particular point. So, from 100, it is 0010. So, we have to identify which is 0010. This is the sub node in W cube 100. So, it has to reach the transmitter. So, the packet reaches the transmitter of W cube in two hopes, 1 and 2. This is the way how the packet reaches. And then, this is the way how the packet reaches. Then, it follows the path 100 0 to 0000, 0, 0, 0. that is the path, first path, hope number 1 and hope number 2. So, the packet is now at the destination, at the destination W cube. Now, we will see what happens in destination W cube. Packet has reached the transmitter of the destination W cube. Now, from the transmitter, depending upon the destination node. So, we have already reached W cube 0010. Now, from the transmitter, I have to reach to 0110. So, 0, 0110 is this. So, packet is going to move. From the receiver of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, the packet is moving into 0, 0110 1, in a single hope because the destination is a cache node. So, the packet moves there. Now, once the packet is going to move, you are going to get the data. So, every cache miss request or reply packet reaches its destination in minimum 1 to maximum of 8 hopes. So, because of this peculiar structure, whatever be the transition that happens from one end of the chip to another, it can happen at most with 8 hopes. Because in 2 hopes, you can reach this transmitter and then you may take maximum 3 or 4 hopes to reach your W cube of the destination. Once you reach the receiver of the W cube of the destination, you can shift to the other locations which are there within that W cube. Now, let us try to see a different kind of an architecture. So far, we have seen a concentrated mesh of W cube architecture. Now, we will see small world architecture. Given this large NOC, we are going to subdivide this NOC into nine independent regions. And each of these region will have its own wireless transmitter. So, when you look at the slide, 
you can see all the nodes are marked as blue but one node per region is marked with the orange color and the peculiarity of them is these are nodes which are having wireless points they can transmit and receive data in the wireless manner so these are heterogeneous nodes these nodes can send data in wired to its neighbors as well as it can send data wireless form to its adjacent wireless routers now consider this violet color you have a packet that is from source and it is moving to this node as the destination so from this point to this point my data has to travel some animations are been prepared so if you look at the animation you can see that first the data which is there is going to travel in xy routing to the nearest wireless router from the wireless router of the source region there is a single hop jumping to the wireless router of the destination region so your packet moves like this and from there the packet is moving to the corresponding destination this is how in small world architecture data flows so you have an initial xy transition to the nearest wireless hub from the wireless hub of the source region to the destination it is a wireless transmission and once it reaches the destination wireless hub again you apply xy routing now it's an 8 by 8 mesh with a wireless router this can be a scenario where router number 18 22 50 and 54 are marked as wireless routers so these routers have normally four of its wired neighbors plus you have few wireless neighbors also now consider the case that's a packet wanted to travel from 1 to 62 in an 8 by 8 mesh noc with four wireless hubs so packets travel from 1 to 18 in xy routing from 18 to 54 by wireless routing and from 54 to 62 again by xy routing now consider the case that your source is 1 and destination is 12 in this case both the source and destination is relatively closer there is no need to go through a wireless point so the packet will travel from 1 to 12 directly using xy routing so it's kind of a hybrid routing whether should i take a wireless routing or not so that's the adaptivity that is being embedded into the router's intelligence the router should be intelligent enough to understand should i stick on to wire wired routing that we have seen from 1 to 12 or should we stick on to a wireless routing that we have seen from 1 to 62 so i would like to draw your attention to a real life example so iit guwahati is located on the banks of river brahmaputra so this is the campus and it is adjacent to the brahmaputra river and guwahati city is on the other side of the river and it is been connected through the saraigatta uh, bridge which is been shown so this is the path through which uh, uh, we have to go through the city that's a path through which we travel via road and here we have the bridge so it's a pretty long path we do have ferry services also where we can take a ferry such that you can cross brahmaputra river and that is uh, much more time consuming this is the way how the ferry looks like but when too many people come to use the ferry like say we have people coming from different uh, regions of uh, this north bank of uh, brahmaputra river then the ferry is going to be overcrowded we had similar scenario like this when in a wireless router when many of them are trying to send it through wireless the wireless hubs are going to be highly crowded so we get isolated points of congestion and we need to write adaptive routing such that these isolated points of congestion are be eliminated so some experimental results shows that this is a result which we is showing packet latency on the y axis average packet latency and x axis loads shows the load in the network so the x axis is injection rate and the y axis is average packet latency this is a load versus latency graph what you see in green color is the latency when it is a normal mesh noc we can see that as the load increases the latency is also going to increase and it goes to an exponential fashion this is called a saturation point 
Now, when you look at the wireless NOC, an NOC with a wireless structure, that is the blue graph, that is called Wynock NOC. We can see that since we take up the shortcut path through wireless, the latency is very low initially for very load. But as the load increases, a small number of packets try to send it through the wireless node, leading to early saturation. So the takeaway is, using wireless NOC will save you latency if the load is very less. As the load increases, there will be more number of packets which will compete to reach the wireless NOC point and there will be a queuing delay because already the wireless transmitter is sending packets which has reached there early. This scenario is visible in the transpose, so in the case of a tornado traffic also, where you can see the initial latency is less, but it saturates very early. Adaptive routing techniques are being explored in this context. Now, let us try to see one important application of wireless NOC. One of the application is called multicasting. What do you mean by multicasting? Multicasting is the scenario in which there is one source and I have to send data to multiple destinations. So, one data has to reach multiple destinations. Can I make use of the available wireless NOC infrastructure to facilitate multicasting process a bit more faster? So, consider the scenario. Let us say we have uh, uh, four wireless access points at 18, 22, 41 and 53. It is a small world architecture. Now, these are the nodes where you see with uh, violet color 1, 7, 31, 50, 56, 60 and 63 are the destination. A data which is starting from 8, that is a source, has to reach all these nodes which are marked with violet color. And how am I going to use? So, a packet from 8 will go into 18 and at 18, you are going to broadcast it. So, 3 messages will be created from 18. So, these three messages are going to reach into the appropriate wireless nodes and you create duplicate packets from these wireless hubs such that all the packets are going to reach into the appropriate destinations. So, this wireless infrastructure helps you to broadcast and then selectively multicast once it reaches each of these quadrant. So, in applications, we need certain scenarios where a same data has to reach to multiple points and this is very much needed in cache coherence. So, where one node will validate or invalidate the data that is located in many other nodes together. In that case, having a wireless NOC infrastructure is going to help us. So, how it works, the multicasting in cache coherence? Let us say we have a packet from 8 that goes all the way to 18. A packet starts from 8, it reaches 18 and it is having some information which will tell where are it should be going. So, this meaning is the packet has to go to 2, packet has to go to 8. So, 2 and 8 are the nodes which should get this packets in this quadrant. So, 18 will come to know where all this data has to be sent. Let us say the 18 is going to send the packet to 22. Once the packet reaches 22, it knows which are the quadrants in 22 that are to get the data. So, 7 and 31 is going to get the data. So, once the packet reaches 22, you have to create appropriate forwarding mechanisms such that the data reaches 7 with one packet and data reaches 31 with the other packet. So, this kind of a specialized header structure will help the wireless routers to take appropriate actions in forwarding a multicast packet. Now, coming into the broadcasting scenario, what do you mean by broadcasting? Let us say a packet from one node has to reach all other nodes. Sending clock signals is an important requirement of broadcasting. Powering up the system, booting, you have to send a special command to all the routers such that they should start its booting process, power up reset. So, these kind of signals which are known as broadcasting, which should reach all the nodes and that can be better improved with the help of wireless infrastructure. The left side will show how a broadcasting message from zero will reach all other nodes in a conventional two-dimensional mesh NOC. The right side is a wireless NOC with four nodes, 18, 22, 50 and 54 having wireless access point. 
So, how the same broadcast message starting from 0 is going to reach all other nodes. So, that is been shown with the help of an animation. Let us say in the, a data which starts from 0 will reach node number 1 and 8 in one hope. So, these are nodes which are already received the data. So, nodes that have received the data is marked in yellow color and nodes that are yet to receive the data is marked in blue color. Let us see how this yellow color is going to progress. In the next clock cycle, the neighbors of those who are marked will become yellow. The next clock cycle, the next set of neighbors are going to get the data. So, this is same in the case of left side wired NOC and right side the hybrid NOC. Next, they are going to reach the same point. Now, what we can see that it has already reached the wireless NOC router. So, in the next hope, 50, 54 and 22 also will get the data and then they are going to send it to their neighbors. So, with this, the wireless NOC has transmitted the data or rather broadcasted the data to all its nodes, whereas in the case of wired, still more nodes are pending. So, it takes few more cycles for the data to reach all the nodes. In this way, by having a wireless NOC infrastructure, your data will reach all the nodes rather very fast. So, wireless NOC can be used for broadcasting, can be used for multicasting and can be used for better communication from end to end. So, we have given a brief overview about what is the infrastructure of a wireless NOC by W cube structure by small world architecture. So, the summary of this is multi core processors and on chip clouds we have seen lot of computers in a single chip that is what is known as on chip clouds are going to become an integral part of future digital technologies. And understanding the hardware of such system will help us to design with conceptual clarity. So, our country needs good computer architects and processor design engineers with hands on exposure to VLSI design flow to cater the growing demand of skilled personnel in this domain. If we want our country to have our own processors, the digital technology has to be empowered. It is not about writing softwares alone. We can design our own chips. We spend a lot of money in importing chips. So, why can't we develop our own processors? Initiatives have already taken and uh, people with the background of computer architecture are the need of the hour. So, I hope that whatever discussions we had in this course will really help you to go deeper into the topic and further read about architecture related research materials. Students can work for projects in this domain. Faculty can mentor students to do take up small computer architecture related projects. So, I will give you a couple of advices how to work with this domain, those who wanted to do research, those who wanted to do projects in this domain, where can you get material from. So, how to explore computer architecture further. So, of course, the good research is always found in good transactions. We have IEEE and ACM transactions and good journals, IEEE transactions on computer aided design, transactions on VLSI, transactions on computers, journal of parallel and distributed computing, journal of supercomputing, then ACM transactions on design automation of electronic systems, ACM transactions on embedded computing systems, transactions on architecture and code optimizations. These are the top journals in this domain. So, if you wanted to know what is the kind of research happen in this domain, I request you to go and read the research materials available on this and learn for uh, multi-core computing, caches, network on chips, storage on chips, etc. We have very good peer reviewed conferences also in this domain, the Symposium for Computer Architecture, a very good highly rated conference, High Performance Computer Architecture, the Micro Architecture Conference. Then we have the ASPLOS, Architectural Support for Programming Languages and Operating System. We have Parallel Architecture and Compilation Techniques, Design Automation and Test in Europe, Design Automation Conference, International Conference on Computer Aided Design. These are all well reputed conferences where research on computer architecture, multi core computer architecture, the interconnects, caches, processors are all, all presented. 
then specifically to network on chip we have network on chip symposium network on chip architecture workshop these are exclusively for noc domain then we have the international symposium on vlsi international conference on computer design asia south pacific design automation conference vlsi system on chip conference great lake symposium on vlsi design so these are all good conferences which will give you good material these are considered to be tier 2 conferences and the first one is tier 1 this is tier 2 and then these conferences happen in india high performance computing conference the vlsi design vdat the international symposium on electronic design these are all conferences within india itself and then we need to go through the materials that is been published and remodel existing work this is a basic step to work with architecture related projects whatever is the existing work that is already mentioned in these papers try to redo them and uh, that has been done with the help of simulators and some of the graphs that we have discussed in this course is uh, been obtained the values are obtained by working with the simulators so we have full system simulators like gem5 multi2 sim sniper tejas and all we have micro architectural simulators which will deal with only certain aspects of the architecture like book sim dram sim u sim and all so full system simulator will model your processor your os your memory hierarchy your interconnects everything will be there but if you wanted your study to be focused on certain topics then the micro architectural simulators will help and then we have power tools which will model this cacti is a tool which will help you to uh, to estimate the power associated with the storage systems orion will help you to find out power associated with interconnection systems so read research material try to work with open source simulators model the existing work on these simulators try to see the numbers what they claim in these research papers are really obtaining in your experimental modeling also and once you come up with good designs these system simulators will give you what is approximate time throughput latency speed up and all and then whatever is architectural change that you have proposed we have to model in hardware description language so model the architecture in simulators and implement them using hdls and verify these sub modules in fpga kits uh, to test whatever design that you have proposed is indeed really working or not so with this uh, i complete this lecture so we have started from the fundamentals of uh, microprocessors we learned a bit of pipelining the advanced features of pipelining what are superscalar processors then we looked into on chip storages we understood what our cache memories and then the interconnection mechanisms we had in between a quick overview of DRAM systems. So with this course, I have tried my level best to give an overall picture about what is multi-core computer architecture all about. So uh, I request majority of you to, to explore this domain further. There were a good number of candidates already done this registration and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis working with the assignments. So prepare well for the end exam course that is scheduled on, August, on October 7th. So, lot of questions you will get. If you are very much thorough with the assignments, that will really take you up to 30 to 40 percent of these questions. Go through the slides, go through the study materials. So, attending all these video lectures, surely it will be, you can score more than 70 to 80 percent of marks. There will be a couple of questions which will check your deeper understanding. So, overall, those who have put in systematic effort, I am sure that uh, this course is going to help you in understanding and appreciating the hardware of these machines. And uh, students who really do well at the end of this course, I can consider a couple of them uh, to, uh, to join our research group for internships. And we welcome faculty members also to have active collaboration with uh, uh, the computer architecture group at IIT Guwahati. So we look for uh, really motivated students and faculty members to have collaborations in this field. I hope you enjoyed this course. We were planning to have more number of courses related to architecture domain in these coming semesters. So wish you good luck. Thank you. All the best.